Well, Father, we're grateful for all your grace and mercy. We thank you that Christ paid for our sins on the cross, that every last thing that we've ever done wrong or ever will do wrong was, was dealt with and paid for, and he was punished in our place. There is no punishment for sin. So we come today to talk about sin and, and your plan for dealing with it in our life. So we want to look at the Bible. We want to see the scriptures and discuss what they say and give us insight and understanding, Father. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're in Romans chapter 6. If you open your Bibles, you do have Bibles to Romans chapter 6. And we're going to see Paul discussing the issue of sin. Listen, this is, the, this is the bugaboo for Christians because the world thinks that once you become a Christian that it's some kind of human commitment that you make and based on the strength of your human commitment <clears throat> you're supposed to live this moral life. Many confuse Christianity with a moral life. So we, we look for morality from Christians and some Christians, those with ascetic trends, look moral. They look like they're Christians. They act like Christians. And therefore, uh, they sort of skate by. Those with lascivious trends, I won't point anybody out in here, uh, but those, those don't look so good. These are the ones that enjoy the, you know, the buffet. And I'll stop right there. See, there's different types of sin. In fact, what I want, one of the things I want you to see out of Romans chapter 6 is that when Paul talks about sin, he calls it the sin. Hey, hamartia, it's the sin. It's not sin. And so people have read this and said, well, that's the sin nature. And surely that is the truth. But it's more than that. It's more than just the nature, okay? So we want to see this. Let's read. We're going to see in this passage, I want to point out there's four things, four categories. One is position in Christ. If you have your sheets. The second is going to be the possibilities in Christ. And that's the important part of this passage. That's really the key. The third is going to be the perspective that we have because of who we are in Christ. And then there's going to be a fourth one. It's going to be to present yourself. The whole application part of the passage is about presenting yourself either to sin or to God. So let's read Paul's answering questions. In chapter 3 through 5, he's dealt with the fact that Christ has paid for sin. See, sin is, again, the big bugaboo. What are we going to do about sin? Churches today struggle with what are we going to do about sin? You dirty sinners. And legalism says you have to pay for your sin, even though Christ paid for it. Emotionalism says if you get emotional enough, you can overcome your sin or live above your sin with this emotional high. Ritualism, when you sin, you just come and you drink or this or that, and boom, you're good. Intellectualism, which would be more of our ism, says, well, you just come and do a Bible study, do an hour of Bible study, and you're good to go. That solves all problems. Of course, we know none of those things are sufficient in and of themselves. So let's read. Paul says, what shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace might increase? And we know that's rhetorical, right? We know that we're not to go on sinning. By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And again, this is, this is rhetorical's. Don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. There's your first possibility. Because of who you are in Christ, and he's died to sin, paid for sin, given us resurrection life, we can now walk in newness of life, which is what Paul's going to call later on the new man. The new way of thinking about your life, about yourself, about God, about relationships. It's a new way of thinking that patterns after Christ. We have that possibility. Verse 5, if we have been united with him in his death, and we have, if, you're, if you've trusted that Christ died for your sins, was buried, raised from the dead, then you've been baptized into Christ and you're part of Christ and now this applies to you. You've been, you've died with him, been buried with him and raised with him. And now we're in this raised resurrection life that's this possibility. But it's not the only possibility. If we've been united with him and we have, we will certainly also be, in his death, excuse me, we shall also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self, that's what he calls the old man, was crucified with him, and this is a metaphor, so that the body of sin, really, real important phrase, might be done away with, that we should, with the result that we no longer have to be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. So, we see this position we have in Christ, and we'll talk about it. And then we see in verse 4 the possibility to live a new life. And in verse 6, the possibility to do away with the system that causes us to sin. Well, we'd be living perfectly, wouldn't we? He said, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Do you know that when he went to the grave and three days and three nights later when he walked out of the tomb, that he had defeated death? Death itself went down. Death. I mean, there's nothing more certain than death and taxes. Now, he didn't defeat taxes. Lord, make that next. But when you die, if you're saved, then you're secure. You're going to be raised again with a resurrection body and live with God forever. And all those that you're, your loved ones who are saved, you're going to live with them forever. Amen. You like that? I do too. That's what Paul's saying. In light of that, we need to think about our sin in a certain way. So, verse 11, in this same way, consider yourself dead to sin. And that's real important because now he's getting into the admonitions. Consider yourself dead to sin while living to God in Christ. <clears throat> Then he says, therefore, do not allow sin to rule in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin. This is the presenting. Do not present your bodies to uh, sin, to the sin. Listen, don't present your body to the sin. Real important, the sin. You would say the sin nature. I say the sin nature and the ideas that we all developed from the sin nature. But he says, instead, offer your body, offer yourself to God as those who've been brought, who has been brought to life from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. Sin shall not be your master, you're not under law, but under grace. Now, let's look at some principles here. First of all, 
Let me give you an outline of verses 1 through 14. Verses 1 through 10, he talks about position in Christ. We've been baptized or identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. When you believe in him, that he is your Savior, that he died for you, was buried and raised, then when you believe that, then God, in the mind of God, you go back in, in time and you're literally, figuratively, again, it's a metaphor, you're hanging on the cross with him. When your sins come down and he's paying for them, you're there with him paying for those sins. When he goes to the grave, you're with him. When he comes back out, you're with him. That means that's what being baptized with him or in him means. So, and then, then verse four and six, we see possibilities. These are opportunities, first, to walk in newness of life, and second, to do away with the old man, the body of sin. Thirdly, in verse 11, we see a perspective which is the word reckon or consider. Legizomai means to use divine logic to conclude that you have died with him, been buried with him, and raised with him, and now you have the opportunity to live this new man life like Christ. And listen, it's not a rule system. It's a relationship. It's not rules. It's a relationship with a real person. God is a real person. And because of who you are in Him, you, the heavens have opened up. The access to God's grace in your life in every category has been given. You have access. We're trying to learn about it. Listen, you can't, you can't make access. You can't take advantage of what God's given you, the possibilities, if you don't know about them. So I would encourage you to learn. And fourthly, from, from verse 13 on to verse 23, you're going to see to present yourself. And this word means to yield, to place yourself at someone's disposal. So I want to talk to you for just a minute about some Greek. And trust me, I'm not going into it. But I need you, you need to understand what an aorist subjunctive is. An aorist is a point in time Divorce from time. In other words, the heiress shows a scene. If you're in a if you're in a movie, and the right the the director wants to take you back to an event that happened, that's the basis of this thing you're watching right now. You know the flashback. What the heiress would do would just show you a frame. Two people are fighting here. You would go back in time and just see a moment. That's the heiress. It's just a moment. Well, it, show, it takes everything and puts it in one picture. So your whole future in one picture. The subjunctive is the mood of possibility. It's the mood of probability. He says, if we confess our sins, maybe you will, maybe you won't. That's subjunctive. It's up to you. So... This position that you now have in Christ has opened up these possibilities. One is to live the new man life. And the other is that while you're doing that, while you're living this new man life, you could be doing away with that which would draw you away from this new man life. Your old thinking. So, we have two heirs subjunctives. One in verse 4, walking in newness of life. And one in verse 6, doing away with the old self. Point C here is that verse 4 is hena plus the aorist subjunctive of peripateo. It means that so that we might walk. And this word means to go around. It, it, the word peri means around. Pateo, I call it peripateo, but Pateo meant to go from one, from one vendor to the next vendor to the next vendor. It shows the daily activities of your life in a sphere that is your life. This is your daily decisions. You can walk in this new kind of life, this spirit life, this eternal life. 
If you've trusted in Christ, you already have eternal life. You don't wait to the end of your life, and God weighs your good deeds and bad deeds. And if you've got more good deeds, you go to heaven. More bad deeds, you go to hell. You've heard that? That's what most people think. That's how most people think it works. When you trusted in Christ, all of the weight of your bad deeds was put on him and paid out so that you can be in him forever and never have to pay for those things again. They're paid. Your sins are paid for. Did you know that? You don't have sins hanging over your head with God. I know that thing you did way back in so-and-so and and that nobody else knows about. I know about that one. I really don't, but I know you know about it. Guess what? God's not waiting for the right opportunity to get you. That's what a lot of people think. The, you know, they I lost my job. Well, God's probably paying me back, paying me back for that time that I did such and such. You know what happened to that time that you did such and such? Where did the punishment go? Went on Christ. It never, ever, ever will come on you. Ever. Let it go. Let it go. You're free. See, you're free to pursue these opportunities. That's what it means to be baptized into Christ, into his death, burial, and resurrection. You're now free to be who God designed you to be. Question is, who are you going to be? What are you going to do with this time that you have? How much time do you have left here? Honestly, maybe till the end of the day. Maybe not. So, let's look at position in Christ. Or we could look at verse 6, this word katargeo, to do away with, means to tear down, to abolish. It's the same word used for the temporary gifts that are going to be abolished. It means to make it operative, to make it null and void. This is your old self. All right? So, before we get into these categories, let me ask you a question. Before you were saved, or before you came to God, let's say, before you became positive to God and began to listen to His Word, did you form any ideas and beliefs that you operated on? You had no ideas or no concepts or no beliefs that you operated on before you came to God? You did, right? You had things you believed and the way you went about your life. And Let me ask you, when you got saved, what happened to those ideas? Those beliefs that were inside of you, what happened to them? Well, were they? You know, as the counselor, I'm the quote, I'm the counselor, I talk to people, mostly we do marriage. Rhonda and I do a lot together. We do a lot of marriage stuff. And we have people that have been married forever and they're still bitter and, and have walls and defenses with each other. And I say, those walls and those defenses that you have against each other to protect yourself, and, and I'm not doing counseling now, but say, are those from God? Did God tell you to be bitter towards your mate? Well, no. Where, where does that come from? Well, you say, well, I have a sin nature. And my nature, well, my nature. Did you know that, that when you got saved, you got a new nature? Called the divine nature? I'm trying to make a point here. When you got the divine nature, the moment you trusted in Christ, was just possessing that divine nature sufficient to enable you to live the Christian life? Just that nature? No, no. I mean, how many years have we been here trying to put the pieces of this puzzle together? 
beliefs and ideas and concepts and rationales and strategies and approaches and all so much. When the Bible talk, when Paul talks about the sin, he's not just talking about a nature. He's talking about a whole way of thinking about life. That's the human agenda. It's your earthly agenda. It's you pursuing your earthly treasure instead of heavenly treasure. That's the sin. So that may include lascivious sins that are obvious. It may include uh, ascetic sins like self-righteousness and judgmental and criticism, all different types of things, and it includes a whole lot of human good because you're a good person. Oh, I'm a good person. You're just a good person in the sin he's talking about here. The good person you are is the person without God. You're a good person without God. That's the sin. So the sin here is not just the sin nature. It's the belief system and the ideas and everything that goes along with putting your earthly treasure ahead of the Lord. You put your earthly treasure ahead of the Lord. And listen, it's hard to ever get past doing that. I mean, what we used to call the details of life, your family, your children, you know, your security, your finances, those types of things, those are things that we've spent a lot of time and effort dealing with. But listen, if you look at this position in Christ, the day that you trusted in Christ, all of those things became guaranteed. Your living, your logistical grace became guaranteed. How much effort do we put into something that we, that's already guaranteed? Wondering whether we'll have enough. I got a very dear friend of mine. Some of you know him. I won't call his name Barry. Uh, we have these discussions about security. I'm like, Barry, how much is enough? How much is enough? He's like, I don't know. I haven't got there yet. How much is enough? So, do you have enough for today? You got enough. You got enough. Because tomorrow when you get up, what's God going to do? He's already sent what you need for tomorrow. When you go to bed tonight, he sends it. And when you wake up in the morning, it arrives. The sunshine, the air, the food, the everything. When you're in Christ, it says you've been baptized into him, identified with him. <clears throat> now, Paul was a theological genius, taught personally by the Lord himself. He's the one that helps us understand the entire Bible. You can't understand the really, you don't, see, Paul interprets the Bible, the whole Old Testament he interprets. He explains that the entire Old Testament was all about pointing to Christ. His coming, what would it be like? What's he going to do? Who's he going to be? It was all about Christ. And nobody understood that. They thought it was about keeping the Mosaic law, rule keeping. When you were baptized into Christ, you share in the benefit of all Christ earned in his death, burial, and resurrection. You're in a permanent union with him. Here's the cross, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and here you are. And you decide to believe in him for your salvation. You're immediately placed into union with Jesus Christ forever. You can't ever get out of there. This is your security. This is what opens up all the access to all the blessings that God has already created. First thing God did when he started to build and create was to create your blessings. All your blessings are in a warehouse with your name on it. Every time that you trust God, see, you're not only in union with Christ, you're also down here indwelt by the Holy Spirit. 
Every time that you, under the power of the Holy Spirit, believe and trust God's Word, a blessing is transferred to you. And every time a blessing, that thing's full of blessings, this warehouse. And every time you use one of those blessings from heaven, a warehouse in heaven that's empty, hopefully mine's not empty, <clears throat> called rewards, a reward is deposited in that warehouse. So every time you trust God and believe His Word, you receive a blessing. The same time, a corresponding reward is placed in your warehouse in heaven. So when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, guess what? All that's going to be there. But what happens if you never learn Hang on. What happens? Here you are, your death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You believe, you're placed into union with Christ. Here you are, you're indwelt and filled by the Holy Spirit, but you never learn about God. You never learn God's Word. You never learn about all the promises, the 7,000 promises. And so you never take your faith and attach it to the promises of God. Your blessing warehouse is going to remain full. Your reward warehouse is going to remain empty. Right? And so when you get to heaven, and you will, the Bible says as through fire, you got saved, you got placed into union with Christ, giving you security forever, you got indwelt by the Holy Spirit who's available to teach you and be your guide and mentor, but you never availed yourself of that. You didn't know. So here you are. You're going to be in heaven, still in heaven, but without rewards. And so you're going to be cleaning toilets in heaven. So that be okay? Better than going to hell. Right? Don't you dare get out of here without trusting in Christ as your Savior. But listen, what he's talking about here, these possibilities, these possibilities, you've been placed into union with Christ. You've been identified in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. You went through it with him, and now you're in him, and all the blessings of God the Father that God wants to give his son Jesus Christ, he also wants to give you. Because you're in him. You are him. You're his body. So now you're here on earth, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who's available to be your mentor, to teach you these things and take these principles from the Word and make them real to you. See, that's how you do the new man. The new man is this whole new way of life. You get this new nature, which is a tendency to trust and believe and pursue God. See, when you get saved, you have this desire to know about God, to please God, to want to trust God. You have this desire, this good desire about God. You didn't have that as an unbeliever. The Holy Spirit gives you this new nature. But listen, the nature's not enough. You have to construct, let me do another one. In your heart, here's your mind, some of you know this, in your heart is a belief system and before you were saved, you had a belief system that you built out of the world. But once you get saved, so here you are, you've come to the cross, and now you're over here with God, and you begin to learn through the hope from the Holy Spirit all these principles, and you begin to stack these beliefs into your heart. And you have what's called milk, which are foundational beliefs, and then you've got meat, all these little boxes are individual ideas that you have believed meet are the functional doctrines. And what you do is you build a structure of ideas. It's called a hierarchy. We used to call it, what do we used to call that? Edification That's exactly what we used to call it. Edification <laughs> complex. What it meant, a complex was a building. It means you build, you build a structure of ideas in your heart. By faith, you believe these 
principles that become part of your heart and you stack them and stack them and stack them and stack them and now you begin to see, you begin to understand, you have something to work with. You build, see, you build the new man. You develop the new man. You develop the new man, you have to start from way down here at scratch. You start as a baby and you go through development. Hopefully you become mature and you live as a mature believer. Okay, so this first, this position in Christ is what's opened all that up for us. The baptism of, of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, the body of Christ, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all made to drink one Spirit. Okay, so we're... In the body of Christ, this is Christ, Jesus Christ, and you are his body. His arms and legs, his feet, his mouth, and everything here on the earth. We serve his purpose. He's the head. That's how it works. Okay? And that's what the baptism of the Spirit did. Now, these possibilities. Let's talk about the possibilities. I think I can erase. Huh? Top sinner. I'm the top sinner? <laughs> Paul said he was the top sinner, but, but I, I'm here. I hear you. Top sinner. Say up here? Yeah, okay. I know he's so, the camera can't get, once it gets down low, the camera can't pick it up. So, all right, let's talk about this possibility. In verse 4, we have the first aorist eris subjunctive, and the aorist subjunctive is a future possibility. So, the first future possibility at verse 4 is we can walk in newness of life. So, what is newness of life? I submit that newness of life is what Paul calls, if you got your Bibles, go to Ephesians chapter 4 real quick. Let me show you something. For those of you that have been involved in this discussion, Paul does one thing. He describes this dealing with sin one way before he goes to prison and then another way after he goes to prison. So Ephesians 4, 24. Chapter 4, verse 24. Well, I'm in Ephesians 4. He says, and look, look at verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. This is the same passage as Romans 6. Talking about your old self. To put off, to take off. See, this is the change. Which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. And being made new in the attitude of your mind. This is the learning. And then he says, and put on the new self. The new man. Well, here you are in union with Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. You're in union with Christ, and now you have these two possibilities. One is you can walk and develop this new man. If you're in, if you stay in Ephesians 4, listen to this new man. He says, and put on the new man created to be like God in, in, in in righteousness and holiness from the truth. So this new man is going to be righteous and holy like who? That's right. This is the mind of Christ. This is the new man is Christ. We have the possibility of developing, here, here we are back in the heart, these little ideas and principles and concepts we build up this complex of ideas, and, and it, listen, it's a construct. You construct it. It's a way of thinking about life, a way of looking at life, a way of dealing with things based on this relationship. It's not just a bunch of rules. It's a relationship. And so this is your first possibility. Is you can walk in newness of life. And then if you look back in, if you hold your place in Ephesians, if you don't mind, and go back to Romans 6, 6. 
not 666, but just 66. He says, For we know our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So here Paul's going to say that the body of sin is to be done away with. When you get over to Ephesians, after his imprisonment, after he goes to Jerusalem to show everybody how great he is, and he realizes, you know, I wasn't, but that wasn't for God at all. That was all about me. That's why he went, ended up in jail. So Ephesians 4.22, he says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life, the old man. See, now here's the old man, new man. And I know you guys say, oh, you teach the same thing. You know why I teach the same thing? This is the Christian life. There is no other Christian life than this. This is it. You're dealing with the sin in your life and the ideas and principles that you've uh, adopted into your life earlier that you still live by, and you're trying to live this new man. You're trying to be like Christ and grow and develop. This is it. There's no more to it. It's, it's trying to become like Christ and being hindered by this old thing, and so you have to keep looking at it and going, why do I keep going back to that? Why do I keep going back to that? Why am I still bitter? Why am I still bitter about something that happened when I was a little kid? Why am I still afraid? Why do I live my life in fear? You don't live your life in fear from the new man. The new man's not afraid. The new man's not bitter. But this guy sure is bitter. He's afraid. He's angry. His life hasn't worked out the way he wanted. See, if, if you did a poll, and I've done this, I've seen these done. What people, if you say, describe your life, what's the one word that you say would describe your life? People say, disappointed. It was supposed to be different, right? It was supposed to be different. See, that's old man stuff. New man says, disappointed. Holy smokes, I got everything. I got everything. I mean, I've got God forever. I've got, I'm going to have a resurrection body that can fly around like a jet, that can eat and never get fat. Eat all you want. See, in heaven, you can go to the buffet. And it's not sin. What's, when Jesus walked into the room, what's the first thing he asked him? You got anything to eat? Yeah. No, he, well, he said, peace be still. And then he said, y'all got anything to eat? Now, he's in a resurrection body. Guy was hungry. So here's your two possibilities. You can, you can build and develop this new man life by learning and believing and practicing new man ideas. At the same time, so you've already built this system over here. It's the one you built before you got saved or before you came to God. And so at the same time, when this interferes with you walking in new man, then you have to stop and go, all right, let's look at that and let's eliminate that piece of it. So these are your possibilities. He says you can walk in newness of life, which means to learn, develop, and live out the truth of the new man belief system. At the same time, you're removing the influence of the world by laying aside the old man belief system. So, you have to learn and develop and live out the truth. You have to learn this. And this is just like an introduction. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? What is it that hinders me from doing so? I mean, the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of me. I should have the power to walk in the new man. I understand the truth of the new man. What's hindering me? And that's, what, of course, the old man. So here you are with this opportunity. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead, 
Through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Just like he was raised and walked in a new resurrection body, we are now raised with him and can walk in this new way of thinking. What's most important to you? All right, if you took out a piece of paper and said, what's the top five things in your life? Kids don't count. Kids don't count. Because everybody got my kids, of course. My mate, my kids. How about finances? Is that important? How about entertainment? I might like that one. Movies. What's important to you? Here, here's, here's what I'm after. Is what is at the top of your list, is it here on earth? Is it something you're seeking and pursuing here on earth before you die? See, you know the problem with the old man, he's motivated to get his treasure here in this life. And he's got to get it before he dies. What's more, he's got to get it before he's too old to enjoy it. Right? I mean, if it takes you to your my age to get it, well, okay, I got it. <laughs> I can't do anything with it. So, are you after earthly treasure or are you after heavenly treasure? See, the real treasure, you have to look through the end of this life into the next to see heavenly treasure. You have to live for what's coming next. And listen, you have to live. The mature believer is able to lay aside the earthly pursuits and the earthly treasure to let God use you for his purposes in the angelic conflict, to, for you to come to the witness stand for him against the devil when you're facing adversity and say, do you trust God even though he's letting everything come apart in your life? Do you still trust him? The devil says, why would you trust him? He stopped giving you what you want. This was, this was Job. Stop giving him what he wants. He'll turn against you. He said, it's an exchange. Job said, no. This guy saved me. This guy's given me eternal security. This guy is going to, I'm going to live with this guy forever. I'm not turning against him. It's not about the stuff. It's not about the earthly treasure. It's about the relationship. The goal of the new man is not really ministry, although it looks like that. The goal of the new man is to be completely and totally in love with the Lord. Out of that, ministry will come. You won't be able to help yourself with ministry. Ministry will overflow out of that. You're not heavenly focused. You haven't surrendered your human life for God's use. See, we're not here to build a kingdom, to build a castle, to build some structure that lasts. Men build monuments to themselves with skyscrapers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. They, you know, give them a couple years and they fall apart. They can't last, you know, because things aren't here, are not made to last. It's not going to last here because the new walking in newness of life is not here. We get to walk it here, but it's a heavenly life that we walk in a earthly path. Now, we have this position in Christ and this position in Christ, but see, we, we are, when God the Father looks at you now, he doesn't see you, he sees Christ. The sins are paid for. You're now in resurrected life. You're inside, you've been baptized or immersed into Christ. And when God the Father looks now, he doesn't see you individually with your successes or failures. Your sins or your holiness he sees christ 
And Jesus Christ is perfectly righteous, and that makes you perfectly righteous in the eyes of God. Listen, the eyes of God are everything. It doesn't matter what you think is real or true or right or good. It's what God says is right or good. Talking with some friends. I do have some of those, by the way. I know that surprises some of you, but... Oh, I'm just kidding. And this friend talks about how he, he used to beat himself up all the time. You know, just would, would look at his failures and his shortcomings and just think, gosh, can't you do better? Something, what's wrong with you? And so we were talking and I said, well, does God ever do that with you? Does God ever talk to you like that? Hey, where you been? You know, get up in here and confess your sin so I can hose you down. No, he said, he, he's kind and gracious. God said to me, what I think of you is what counts. Is what I think of you is what is reality. Treat yourself the way I treat you. Talk to yourself the way I talk to you. When you fail, you come to me, you, you acknowledge your failure, and I forgive you, and I cleanse you, and I stand you back up, and I get you back on the path, and I'm kind and gracious and loving. Treat yourself that way. You know why? The eyes of God. His perspective, you are in Christ. You are righteous in, in, in the eyes of the Father. See yourself righteous. This is what Paul's saying part of what he's saying is here, he's going to say, consider yourself dead to sin while you're alive to God. So look at verse 11, if you will, chapter 6, Romans 6, 11. And then we'll come back to this other verse 6 in a minute. He says in verse 11, in the same way, consider yourselves dead to sin while alive to God. So, what he's saying is logizomai. Oh, I know, I can't do it down there, sorry. Logizomai. Now, there's a word that's very famous that's, relate, that's associated with Christ, the logos. You heard that word before? What do you think it means? People say, well, it means word. Jesus, you know, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the logos, and the word was with God. Logos does not mean word. It means so much more than that. Logos is the divine logic by which Christ controls the universe. You know, gravity and physics and thermodynamics and entropy, you heard those terms? The way everything works, biology, the laws of nature, that's the logos. That's the divine principles by which the universe functions. What we're given in the scripture is part of the divine logos so that we can use that divine logos to logizomai, which means to, to analyze something with logic and reach a conclusion. To reach a conclusion. It's a conclusion word. <coughs> So we're to use divine logic to reach a conclusion, and that conclusion is related to ourselves. In the same way, consider our view, what? What does it say? What's your, in verse 11, consider, look at it, yourselves, right? So who are we looking at? Well, I mean, it's you. Who are you looking at? Who, who, who's Paul telling you to look at there? Yourself. You. 
Now, as you look at you, who should you be comparing you with? Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, you look into the mirror of the word and you see yourself and in the, you, see, you look in the mirror and you see yourself and you look in the mirror of the word and you see Christ. And as you go through your daily life and you see yourself act, you compare that with him. So when you go, when you act, when you think something, feel something, say something, do something, and you look at yourself in the mirror doing that, see, you're logizomai, you're considering yourself. Who do you look like? Do you look like you or do you look like Christ? To the degree that you still look like you, that's to the degree you need to grow and change and transform. You always compare yourself with Christ. See, religion compares with other people. <clears throat> religion says at least, see, this is the, the guy, the two guys that went down to pray, the Pharisee and the, you know, the tax collector. At least I'm not like him. So, you know, I hear that a lot. Maybe even say that a lot. I don't know. Uh, but I hear it when people come and talk. You know, if you really understood what my wife was like, <clears throat> what she's, you know, she's this way in public, or right, your husband, and he's this way at home. I'm thinking, well, who are you comparing yourself to? You're comparing yourself to another human, not the Lord. Of course, he's a human, but not the Lord. So you're gonna, you want to you wanna consider yourself, then he says, consider yourself dead to sin. Let's read it again. In the same way, because he, the same way means we've died with him, we've been buried with him, and raised with him. And that, and that has opened these possibilities for us to walk in the new man life and to lay aside and to, and to do away with the old man life. They happen in conjunction with each other. So he, if, we, if, if we die with Christ in the same way, consider yourself. R look at yourself and reach a conclusion. And he says, dead to sin. Dead to sin. So here we are. We're in Christ. We're indwelt by the Spirit, but we still have this old belief system and this new belief system. Hopefully we're learning the Word of God and building this new man belief system, principle after principle, built upon each other. Isaiah says, line upon line, precept upon precept. But listen, we still have this other way. We call it a sin nature, but it's more than that. It's a whole way of thinking about life. It's the earthly agenda that makes the things of this life. I lowered the volume. I'm not sure how, but anyway. He says, while you're living this life, look at that life and consider yourself dead to that. In other words, everything that comes out of that which would be selfishness, self-centeredness, me-centeredness, me, me, me. I'm not getting what I want. I'm not getting what I need. I'm getting something I don't want. I want to change you. I want to fix you. You're not the right, the way you should be. Blah, 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 blah. Who are we to logizomai? Who's Logizomai uh, directed at? What's it say? Remember? We already read it once. Lo consider yourself. yourself. Not your husband, not your wife, mother, father, brother, sister, politicians, Democrats. You don't 
Look at them. You look at yourself and you look at Christ. You look at yourself and you look at Christ. And when you, con when you look at yourself and you reach a conclusion and you look in the mirror, who do you see? Do you see you operating out of your selfishness? Or do you see Christ operating out of the ministry of the Spirit and the Word of God? Which one do you see? Moment to moment to moment. That's how you walk the Christian life. Moment to moment to moment. You look at what's coming out of you, what you're producing, what you're thinking, feeling, saying, doing, and you're asking yourself this question. Does that look like me and my selfishness, or does that look like Christ? Which one is that? Who do I look like? What's my conclusion here? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> he says, consider yourself dead to sin. So, he says, listen, we're in a metaphor. He's in a big metaphor here, and what he's telling you is that when Christ died on the cross, that you were in him, and that old you was in him and was crucified, and now positionally, the old self, the old you, is dead. But you still have his thinking. You were born an orphan, a pauper, beggar, eaten out of the dumpster. One day the king comes along and says, come with me. I'm going to give you the ring. I'm going to give you the, the cloak. You're now my son. You're no longer a beggar. Now you're royalty, right? Yes. Follow the metaphor. But you still, listen, every time you got your king, you got your royal robe and your royal ring and your royal hat and your royal sunglasses, but every time you pass a dumpster, <laughs> your stomach rumbles because you still got that thinking in you. People think that the world system, listen, this is real important. People think that the world system exists outside and that we let it in to influence us to sin. Listen, it's not outside. It's already inside. It's been in you from the day you were born. And you programmed yourself with the human agenda to make this life work for you. Got saved, and now you got this divine agenda that's, that you're hoping to minimize this and maximize that. That's the Christian life. So, Paul says, you're, you have this position in Christ, it's opened up these possibilities. Here's your two possibilities. While you're living in the new man, you can consider the old man dead. And he says, katargeo means to tear it down or abolish it. I want to show you something. Romans was written in about A.D. 57. I know I'm not following notes. I don't ever do that, but I don't know why I write them. Uh, AD 57, we think Romans was written. This is right before Paul goes to Jerusalem. He's, he's gone to all the Gentile churches and he's raised this large amount of money. We don't know how much, but it was a large amount. And he's been advised to give it to a trusted a team, a trusted team of believers and send it to Jerusalem because that's where it's needed. But Paul said, no, no, no. I'm going to Jerusalem. Every step of the way, and this is Acts chapter 20, 18, 19, 20. Every step of the way, somebody comes to Paul and said, Paul, listen, and the Bible says somebody comes to Paul filled with the Holy Spirit and said, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You're supposed to go to Rome. Remember, you're supposed to go to Rome. God's going to get you to Rome one way or the other. Paul, Paul says, no, no, no. Agabus comes and takes off his belt and ties his hands and feet and says, this is what's going to happen to you. 
Paul says, oh, I am so willing to suffer for God. What's Paul's motive? What, what was Paul's core flaw, his biggest flaw? Do you know? Ambition. That's why he, when he was persecuting the church, he, nobody was a better persecutor than Paul. He wanted first prize persecuting ball. You know, the persecuting, uh, what do you call those things at the end of the season? You know, you get to the end of the season, everybody gets a trophy. What do you call that? Banquet. He was at the, he's at the persecutor's banquet. He wants first prize, right? Paul's ambition. Listen, Paul was the last person to see Jesus, and Jesus appointed him as an apostle, but he wasn't one of the 12. So you know what people said to him? Especially in Corinth. They said, Paul, you're not really an apostle. They told him that all the time. If you read 1 and 2 Corinthians, you discover him defending his apostleship. Well, now he's got this chance. He's going to go to Jerusalem with Peter and John and James, and he's going to bring this big pile of money and go, I'm not an apostle. Let me show you who's an apostle, fellas. And he gets there, and James says, yeah, I know, but look, all of the Jews who've gotten saved think that you're teaching that the law has come to an end. Did Paul teach that the law's come to an end? Yeah. <laughs> he did. Paul's teaching the law's come to an end. But James says, that's not acceptable to us. So what I need you to do, Paul, for you to be able to integrate yourself back with us, Jewish Christians, is for you to go to the temple and listen to this. I've got these four guys. They're involved in a Nazarite vow in the temple. I need you, Paul, to pay with this big pile of money, pay their, pay their way through there, and I need you to go to the temple and ritually purify yourself. Now, I don't know if you understand what that means. Paul has been teaching that all of this is done. There is no more ritual purification. Purification has been made and is now sitting in the, at the right hand of God in heaven. There is no ritual purification, but Paul says, okay. So he goes to the temple. He goes to this purification rite. He's going to help these four guys take a Jewish vow. All of it's over with, and but Paul's playing along. Why is he doing that? Ambition. Ambition. Paul thought, I'm saved, I'm secure, I've got all the doctrine, I know more than anybody else. And he did. Jesus himself was his teacher. But what Paul didn't realize, when he wrote Romans chapter 6, verse 6, that while you're walking in the new man, you can abolish or, or do away with the old man, a katergeo, which is not a weak word. But he goes and he does this vow, and the moment he starts to do this purification and vow, he gets arrested. Big riot happens, and they arrest him. And from there, he, he appeals to Caesar, and he goes into prison. And he ends up in, where does he end up? Rome, where he's supposed to go in the first place. God got him there. And it, and it was three years later, listen, it was three years later, that Paul comes back to the same topic. The same topic that you and I deal with every day in our life. What do we do about sin? How do I deal with my sins? Because I still sin. I still get angry. I still get frustrated. I still get afraid. I'm still motivated by fear in my life in a big way. <clears throat> what do I do about that? Well, Paul says, three years later, in Romans, he says, you katergeo, your old self. Now, in Ephesians 4, 22, he says, 
you've been taught you were taught with regard to your former manner of life, the old self. Listen, the same terminology that he uses in Romans 6.6. 6, he said, now you don't katergeo it, you apotithemi. He says, you got to take it off. You got to take it off. You can't just try to render it. Inop- you got to take it off. What does that mean? It means when I'm dealing with my life, when I'm being a husband, and instead of the love of God pouring through my life to my wife, old nasty me is in charge. Old selfish me. Oh, I, I, I say all the right things. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to stupid enough to say the wrong thing. That gets you in trouble, right? Well, I'm going to say the right thing, but bitter, withholding, whatever. Yeah, whatever. What is that? When I look in the mirror, do I see Jesus? No. I see that guy. Well, I thought that guy was dead. Well, he's dead, but his thinking's not dead. His thinking's still in me. And when you don't do what I want you to do, and you don't please me and act the way I want you to, and you don't kowtow to me, and you don't bow to me and scrape and everything else and serve me, then I get my little feelings hurt. And I puff up maybe for days at a time, and then I'm just going to go, whatever. Do whatever you want. I don't care. Whatever. Does that sound familiar to you? You think that came from the new man? It didn't. You think that stuff's outside that you let in, and now you're going to act this way? No, you've been acting this way your whole life. It's in you already. You've already programmed yourself with it. Just because you got saved and got in the new man doesn't mean this stuff went away. That was my question. You had beliefs and ideas and human goals and agendas before you got saved or before you came to God. What happened to them when you got saved? They didn't go away. That stuff's still motivating in you. That's why Paul says you have to take it off. Now, when you act in a way other than from the love of God to edify another believer, whoever they are, and you act out of selfishness or insecurity or fear so many times. It took me so many years to see people and and following Peter, it took me so many years to see women especially but men as well, operating out of fear. Fear of what other people think. That's a big one. Oh, my goodness. Honey, I invited some friends over. Uh, It's going to take us four hours to clean the house. Well, it's okay if we don't. It's okay if the house is not clean. Are you kidding me? shotgun fear and then I looked at myself and I go what am I afraid of living my life and not ever feeling successful not ever feeling like I gave it my all I did my best I reached the goal being a failure being lazy all of my flaws you know, this is not, this is not, I'm faking y'all out. Those aren't really my flaws. I'm faking y'all out, right? I'm not lazy. I wouldn't rather watch a movie than study. What about you? See, Paul says, you may think all you got to do is just focus on this. In Philippians chapter 3, 
I, I recently had a guy say, well, look, here's what Paul said. All of this old stuff, you, you forget about it. You forget about it. Let me read that to you and we'll close. It's interesting how this misunderstanding has gotten into the church. Philippians chapter 3. Let's just read a little bit of it. He says, finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write these things to you. It's a safeguard. Watch out for the dogs. I don't think he's talking about Charlie and Lola. Those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh, he's talking about circumcision. For it is we who are the circumcision, the Jews, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh. And he said, if you want to talk about confidence in the flesh, I can talk. If anyone else thinks he has reason to be confident in, in, their, in their human agenda, their human life, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day, the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. As for zeal persecuting the church, I got first prize. As for legalistic righteousness, flawless. But whatever, see, he's come to this now after he goes through this whole jail thing and he realizes, why did I go there? Why did I go through the temple? Why was I willing to compromise myself to ingratiate myself with James? What was driving me? When he looked in the mirror, he didn't see Jesus. He saw Paul and his ambition. Whatever was to my profit, all these things he just listed, his past, listen, all these things he just listed were in his past. These were his past accomplishments and, and pedigree. Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss. He's changed his mind for the sake of Christ. Whatever, what is more, I consider everything loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. It doesn't say he's given them up. Listen to me, this is important. He doesn't say I've given them up. It's in the passive voice. All these things were taken from him. His life, all, everything he thought was important, including his human freedom, was taken from him. God took it from him. He said, I now see and I now understand that they are rubbish. And that's cleaning it up. It's dung that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship and sharing of his sufferings. He said, this is, what I'm, this is my new man life. I used to be motivated by this. Ambition. I wanted to be successful. I wanted all of the other apostles to recognize me as an apostle and realize that I had done more than all of them put together, which was true. But who's counting? Paul was, apparently. He said, now, I'm over here. I've, 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 I've gotten rid of that ambition. I got rid of it. He says, now, what I want is to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to him in his death, and so somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead. This is about rewards. Then he says, and this is where the guy came in to me and said, not that I've already obtained this or have been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I do not consider myself yet to have a reached it, have arrived, have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, stretching forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He said, do you read that? Forgetting 
what is behind. He said, all that old man stuff you're talking about, that's all behind you. All you got to do is focus on the Lord. I'm like, okay, I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know Christ. I want to live like that. But this thing that you say is behind me keeps intruding in my life. I keep finding myself motivated by it. I keep finding it interfering in the way I deal with people I love. Now, what am I supposed to do about that? Just forget about it? You think that's what that word means? What the word means, literally, it doesn't mean to forget. It does to forget. It's used in the ancient literature for someone who forgot their coat and left it behind. What he says, what Paul did with his ambition was he looked at it and realized <clears throat> it was part of this system he calls the sin. And he realized it was a lie that this whole motive of ambition that had driven him his whole life was a lie. And so he didn't just forget about it like it never happened. What he did is he changed his mind about it. He, saw, he said, what was, a, what was valuable to me is now what? Dung. I changed my mind about it. Back to Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Consider yourselves. Look at this old motives, ideas, agendas, pursuits, your human agenda as something that's dead. Your life is not here, folks. Your life is not here. Your life is there. Christ is there. We're in Christ. We've been left here to do a mission. We're not here to build a kingdom. We're not here to build human financial security, although I'm for that. I see Ed back there cringing, but uh, can't, listen, it's all part of being smart about what life's about. So you got to deal with a sin issue and you got to figure out what is God's plan so what is it you do when you find yourself motivated for the human agenda instead of God's agenda? What are you, what are you supposed to do with that? Anybody? How about you just admit that? Dead gummit, I'm doing it again. I'm, I'm, I'm fearful that we're not going to have enough money. I'm fearful that I'm not going to be able to please the people in my life and, and my children love me or respect me. I'm fearful. And the Lord's like, son, how is being afraid of that going to help? Let's close. Father, I thank you so much. I pray that these words have meaning and purpose in someone's life. I don't feel like I've put this together well and you're going to have to carry it from here. You're going to have to help people see in their own life where they're motivated like Paul and like me out of the old way, out of my human ambition and my human fear and concern, wanting things that you've already promised, fighting for things in my life that I really don't need. We love you, Lord. We really do. I mean, these people in this room, they love you as much or more than anybody I've ever known in my life. I'm just so proud to be part of all this. I just pray that you give us a vision of our church is reaching into this community, sacrificing ourselves to reach the lost, to bring them in and to nurture them in the Lord. These these last two generations, Father, they are lost. Their families came apart. Their parents left. We've got kids 15 to 25 that never had a stable parent in their life. And, and so I can't be that parent, Father, but you are that parent. And so I'm willing to be used to make that hook up. And so make that 
our mission, Father, and we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.